Let us pray. Father, almighty God, creator of all things, the one who, who saved us from our own selves and who has saved us from all of our sins, Lord, who died on the cross so that we will have a way to be with you in heaven, Lord. You have heard our prayer requests. You've heard our praises, those mentioned and those unmentioned, Lord. And we ask that you would touch Glenn with your healing power, that you would grant Sharon safe travels back to her home in, in, in Tampa, Florida. Palm Bay, Florida. Palm Beach, Florida, sorry. Thank you for for Roald's successful surgery and that he could rejoin us tonight. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for Donna's daughter and children who, and neg although they were exposed to the COVID, they negative tested. Thank you, Lord. Your holy power is awesome. Uh, and Jesus, you, you bless us, Lord, and Open our eyes to see your blessings and to recognize your, your way in our life every day. And now, Lord, we thank you for your word. And we ask that you would reveal your word, Lord, to each one of us, so that your word will become a part of us and that we will think, act, and speak according to your word and that everything we do and say will be pleasing to you, Father. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. 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 So, my friends, hey, Swati, welcome. Hello. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. We have better weather this, this Wednesday than last Wednesday, so. Yeah, I enjoy it. This time I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we, this week, we're going to look at chapter 25, Acts chapter 25, so get your Bibles ready. And um, a sort of a recap of last week, we, we saw how, you know, flattery will get you nowhere. Flattery, flattery will not, you know, in place of flattery, we should compliment people, but it has to be genuine without expecting anything in return. But people who flatter people, they, you know, they make it up and they sweet talk people because they expect favor or something in return. And then we learn that you must not be a false witness. You must not be a false witness and, and do not support people who are lying. Because if we support somebody who is lying, it's as if we are lying too. And then always state the facts, get the facts. You know, there is, a, there is a, a three of my favorite words. The first one is clarify. Clarify, get the facts. The second one is clarify. And the third one is clarify. <laughs> it's like a filtering process, you know, to get the truth. Because especially in today, you never know what's the truth. Clarify. Ask, if you're not sure, ask and find out. But get the truth. And then when people accuse you, and they will, and I'm sure all of you have been accused sometime for something. Ask them to prove it. Ask for an example, a specific example, because people make up things. Put them back on the spot. You know, remember we have a saying, if somebody put a monkey on your back, put the monkey back on, on their back. Put them back on the spot, ask them to prove it. Like Paul asked, prove it. You say I'm a rioter, you say I'm, you know, this desecrate in the temple, prove it. And they couldn't prove it. And, and, and so far we've seen evidence. God will always take care of his people. He will always take care of his people. And, you know, in the midst of what's happening in Ukraine and in Russia, God is taking care of his people. We don't know about it, but he's taking care of his people. And always be ready to share the gospel message anywhere at any time. See, that's the one of the unique things about the gospel message. We don't have to go to a special place to, 
to share it. It can be anywhere. It can be in the supermarket. It can be at the doctor's office. It can be walking down the street with your neighbors. And, and it doesn't have to be verbal. It can be a smile, nonverbal. Actions speak louder than words. Show kindness, the gospel message. Fruits of the spirit, gospel message. Anybody had any thoughts, any experiences during this past week that kind of reflect what we studied last week? Before we get into chapter 25? Nope. Okay, so we have 27 verses and there are two, three, six of you. Six in the 27, Sharon is what? Four? Four. Four verses each. So um, Sharon, would you read verse one to four for us? And Beatrice, would you read verses five to eight? And Roll, would you read? You can read, right, Roll? Yes, sir. I can. Nine and 13 and Hartley, 14 to 20 and Swati, 21 to 27. Okay. Thank you. Online. Okay. Mr. Three days Peter. after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They urgently requested Festus, requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me and press charges against the man there, if he has done anything wrong. After spending eight or 10 days with them, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul appeared, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him, which they could not prove. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. But Festus wanted to gain favor with the Jews. So he asked Paul, would you be willing to go to Jerusalem and be tried on these charges before me there? Paul said, I am standing before the emperor's own judgment court where I should be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews as you yourself well know. If I have broken the law and done something for which I deserve death penalty, I do not ask to escape it. But if there is no truth in the charges they bring against me, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to the emperor. Then Festus, after conferring with his advisors, answered, you have appealed to the emperor, so to the emperor you will go. Sometime later, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to pay a visit of welcome to Festus. Since they were staying there several days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there is a man here who was left in prison by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me about him and asked for a sentence against him. I told them that it was not the custom of Romans 
to hand over anyone before the accused had met the accusers face to face and had been given an opportunity to make a defense against the charge. So when they met there, I lost no time, but on the next day, I took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they did not make, they did not charge him with any of the crimes that I was expecting. Donna. You didn't tell me any verse, uh, Mr. Kokaram. I didn't? No, you didn't. Oh, sorry. Hardly, you just read what, 14 to up 20? To, up to 18. Go to 20. Okay. okay. Instead. Uh, and Go going? ahead, Hartley. Hello? Go ahead. Okay. Instead, they had certain points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Since I was at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wished to go to Jerusalem and be tried there on these charges. All right, Swati, 21 to 27. Yeah. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved onto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be keep till I might send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said unto Petrus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he thought, shall hear him. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come and Bernice with great form and was entered into the place of hearing with the chef, chief captain and principal man of the city, at the Festus commanded Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all men which are here present with us, we are see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he thought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord, Wherefore, I have brought him forth before you, and especially before thee. O King Agrippa, that after examined, had I might have some bought of to write. For it seemed to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not withhold to signify the crime laid against him. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord God, the word of the Lord for yeah. us. To the God. Amen. So, <laughs> some of the, the main themes in this chapter 25, we see here, Paul is going to another trial. You know, he, this is like about the third trial. And it seems as if the governors are passing the buck because they have like two minds. They want to please the Jews, but they want to judge fairly too at the same time. So they keep passing the buck, and they still, up to now, can't find a guilty verdict. And the false charges is the same false charges that the Jews are repeated, but not proven. Is they repeating the same false charges, but they can't prove it. And then we see that Festus was more pleased, more interested in pleasing more. the Jewish leaders instead of being a fair judge. And Paul, you know, being a Roman citizen, appeals to Caesar. And then we are introduced to King Agrippa and, and Bernice, and who, you know, asked to listen to Paul. You know, and as I read this, I see how 
more and more people are becoming interested in what Paul has to say. And his audience is growing like every chapter. Do you see that? How his audience is growing in every chapter. So the Jews are thinking they're trying to get rid of Paul, but what they're doing is they're creating more opportunity for Paul to share the gospel. I thought the Lord works. Man, a man makes his plan, but the Lord's plan always comes true. So in verse one and two, Festus is, if you remember, is the new governor who replaced Felix. And he listens to the accusations of the chief priests and Jewish leaders. But, but he was in Jerusalem. Paul, in the meantime, was in Caesarea. So they asked Festus to bring Paul to Jerusalem from Caesarea as a favor to them. But their favor, their plan was to ambush him on the way, just as how they had planned when Felix, when he was, and they had to sneak him out in the middle of the night. Remember when his, his nephew found out and told him, and the, the commander sent a come with 600 men to guard him and put him on a horse and take him to Caesarea. Same situation here. But they had ulterior motives. And, and the Lord is aware of this. So now the, it's obvious that the, in verses four and five, the Lord inspires Festus to refuse their request. And then said, okay, Ethan, so you come to Caesarea with me and press your charges. And in, even in the court of law today, you know, the accuser has to face the accused in the court of law. And, and we see this happening even in this time. So in verse seven, we see that up to now, the Jews still cannot prove the charges they brought against Paul. They can't prove it. And then in verse eight, Paul defends himself. Uh, you know, Paul, we gotta really acknowledge and appreciate and applaud Paul for his strength and for his courage and his willingness to speak up. He never gave up. This man never gave up. I don't know about you, but me faced with all these problems and trials, I might have given up. <clears throat> they have your way of kind of do, but Paul never give up. And then in verse nine, uh, Fe Festus is still trying to please the Jews. He asks Paul if he was willing to go to Jerusalem to be tried, you know? And Paul's strong defense. Um, Donna, would you read verse 10 and 11 for us again? Unmute yourself, please. Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender, or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof the, these accuse me, no man may deliver unto me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. You know, and the fact that he appealed unto Caesar, no. Festus has no choice but to send him to Caesar. So he just, in verse 12, he decides to send Paul to Caesar, the, the emperor. And then in verse 13, we see, we see King Agrippa II and Bernice come to Caesarea to pay respects to Festus. Now Agrippa is uh, the son of the Agrippa, King Agrippa I, and his role was to oversee the temple in Jerusalem and nominate the, whoever would be the priest. Bernice, we only have one in mention of her as the sister of Agrippa II. So that's how she was there. Now, notice in verse four, 14 to 17, Paul's case was the topic of discussion between Festus and Agrippa. You know, he, it was like a hot topic of, of this discussion, what was going on. And 
it is obvious that they found Paul to be unique and interesting. This is a different man. This man is saying things they've never heard before. And it tweaked their interests. And then Festus tells Agrippa that Paul was not accused of any crime and he used the word that he expected. So when, when the Jews were accusing Paul, he thought they would accuse him of normal crime like murder, like rioting, like stealing. But then those were not crimes that they accused him from, of. And then note how Festus shares what Paul claimed about the resurrected Jesus Christ. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is spreading, even in this situation, even in this situation. And I, again, I got to admire Festus' honesty and his transparency in verse 20 when he admits his confusion and unwillingness to judge Paul. He couldn't find any grounds. He was confused. He was like caught between two thieves kind of deal. So he admits it, which it takes a big man to admit something like this. And then he explains how Paul appealed to Caesar. And of course, King Agrippa know that if the law of the land, if Paul appealed to Caesar, we got to send him to Caesar. He's a Roman citizen. Now notice what happened in verse 22. Agrippa asked to hear Paul. Again, more opportunity for the spreading of the word and the gospel. And, and look at in, in verse 23, they made a big deal of this hearing because people from all over, the leaders, commanders, they all were there like, you know, it was a big deal. So what, what I see here is Paul's audience is expanding and more and more people are getting to hear the gospel message. So, so the plan of the Jews is backfiring on them like most evil plans. And then in verse 24 to 25, Festus is very honest in his declaration that he found nothing Paul did deserving death and why he was sending Paul to Rome. Um, Sharon, can you go to Acts chapter 23 and read verse 11 for us? And unmute, unmute your, Acts chapter 23, verse 11. Okay. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem. So you must also testify in Rome. So you see how the Lord's will is taking place here? It's his plan all the time for Paul to go to Rome. And it's happening according to his will. Um, in the meantime, Hartley, would you look up Acts 23, um, verses 26 to 30, and I'll tell you when to read that for us. Mm -hmm. So, so Festus in verse 26 is very open and transparent about a lack of knowledge as to what to write in a letter to Caesar. In that if he's going to send Paul, he has to write a letter why he's sending Paul, what are the, ex are the accusations, what he did wrong. And Festus is at a loss of what to write. Remember in Acts 23, 26, 30, the commander wrote a, a nice letter to Felix. Go ahead and read that letter again for us, Hartley. Claudius Lysus, to the Excellency, the Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by Jews and was about to be killed by them. But when I learned that he was a Roman citizen, I came with guard and rescued him. Since I wanted to know the charge for which they accused him, I had him brought to their council. I found that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but was charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. When I was informed that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once 
ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. Yeah, so that was the letter that um, Festus was trying to, to design a letter. Now, if you imagine that you are Festus' advisor and he comes to you and he says to you, I need to write this letter to send Paul to, to, to Rome, to Caesar. What should I write in the letter? Any ideas? What would you tell him to write? Stick to the facts. Stick to, what are the facts? Yeah. The facts what? are that they have, just what he says, that there's nothing here on the Roman law of which he could be accused. But it is their own law, their own regulations that they are disputing. And almost identical to their letter. Yeah. That, but, I, but it looked like Festus was not privy to that document. But you see, they had to write something. They couldn't go to the emperor with any willy nilly yeah. say or thing. You know? Exactly. Exactly. So they had to sift it out through all of these people. <laughs> and they would be held at not being able to rule or govern their particular states and cities. Yeah, but, you know, and, and if he could get a copy of that letter, all he have to do is duplicate it to, to, to um, Caesar. Caesar. But the important thing here is Paul is a Roman citizen. And that's why he's coming. I'm sending him to you. He's a Roman citizen. One, Two, I have not found him guilty. I've hardly told us we are breaking any Roman law of the land that is deserving of death. This is an internal battle between these people. And there's no, you no know, issues, really. No law is broken. This man did not break any law. Be very clear about it. And, and I guess, uh, I, don't, I didn't look at chapter 26, 20. 726 yet to see if Festus wrote a letter or what. But we will find out next week when we look at chapter 26. So any comment to a kind of short lesson today? Any comments, thoughts, reflection that you want to share with us tonight? It doesn't have to be about this chapter 25. It could be anything from previous chapters or anything that comes that the Holy Spirit put on your mind to share. Paul, that Paul seemed to be very consistent in his, in his case, while the accusers seem to be waffling around trying to <laughs> trump up evidence, <laughs> trying to make a case. <laughs> But isn't that the case when people don't, they know not speaking the truth? They all change their story, kind and, of deal. They but rent it, a crowd, they say they rent a crowd. Yeah, the, the truth is the truth. Yeah. Any other comments, thoughts? Yeah, that, that Festus, being newly appointed, had to be very careful in what he wrote to the emperor. Yeah. Because he couldn't be appear to be bias in any way since he was recently appointed. So that's why he was trying to be very careful. Very careful. And then he is not writing to a governor. He is writing to the emperor. You know? Right. So he's... Yep. Good observation. Anybody else? Anything you want to share with us? Well... Some of the main lessons we learned tonight is the facts, the truth takes precedence over favor. The facts and the truth always should take precedence over favor. We have people who bend the truth, who hide the truth because they know you, and are real, you know, and then God knows all and he will foil the plans of evil of evildoers. His good will be done in all circumstances. God's will will be done in all circumstances. I know we can't see everything right now. And sometimes we might wonder, how can this be happening? 
But God, ha we got to remember he has a plan in all things. And, and a day will come when we will, he will explain his plan to us. The one, um, I can't remember it was yesterday or the day before in the verse for the day when he told Peter, you may not understand what I'm doing right now, but a day will come later when you will understand. You are not understanding what I'm doing right now, but a day will come when you will understand. I personally, I don't understand why in this time and age, a country like Russia could attack a country like Ukraine and kill so many people. Just, I can't understand it, but I have to dig deep into my faith to trust that the Lord knows and he has a plan even in all this. Even in all this, in the midst of all of this, he is there, he is there. And then in the midst of trials and tribulations, we can prevent the gospel message. In the midst of our trials and tribulations. And, and we will learn later, even when Paul was in prison, from prison he wrote most of the rest of the New Testament, all the letters in prison. He didn't beat up on himself, but he used the opportunity to find a way to complete his mission, to find a way to serve the Lord instead of allowing the circumstances to overcome him. And we're gonna, that's a good example to take. It's so easy to let circumstances break us down and give us a, a sense of, well, I can't do anything. But with, if the Lord is for you, who can be against you? And, and if you plug into his power and you ask him, show me my father, show me how I can serve you, even in this situation. You know, and what comes to mind, you know, in the midst of storms, of the storm, remember in the Sea of Galilee, in the middle of the storm, the Lord came walking on water to his disciples in the middle of the storm. And when he got into the boat, he told the storm, be still. So one day he will tell all this, stop this war, be still, but he's with us. And we always remember that in all things, in all situations, he is with us. And, and that's one of the biggest difference between the Christian faith and all other religions. Our God is omnipresent, all knowing, and he's with us. So that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. Um, anybody have anything you would like to add before I ask Hartley to close us in prayer? No? Okay. Hartley, would you yeah. say a closing prayer for us? Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, we thank you once again for your word, for bringing it to us, opening our minds and our hearts to it. May we use this as an example for our lives, the honesty of Paul, the inquiry of the governors, to be sure that what they are going to say and what they are going to relate will be true. Guide us, dear Lord, in all things desirable to you. Help us to be faithful to each other, to uplift our attitudes, to give each another chance, and above all, to be able to share our word and our lives with other people. Grant that as we go through these terrible trying times, particularly with the COVID pandemic lurking around us still, with the effects of the war in Ukraine to be felt shortly, prepare us, strengthen us, to forego and remember that you are in charge, you are in control, and you will direct all things to those who believe in you. Help us to stay close to you and bring others along with us. 
protect us now as we go to our rest, that our families will be protected and preserved, strengthened and revived for tomorrow's work. Dear Lord, you have never stopped working and neither should we because there's so much to do in this world to lift up other people, the downtrodden, the oppressed, the abused, the ill, the aged, the infirm, all of these people we need to extend a helping hand to. Grant us the strength to so make each other our brothers and sisters, as Jesus did in his time, where he lifted people up, the apostles who gave them the instructions to go and preach the gospel. Help us to be gospel bearers and by our lives be examples for all those who are around us and with whom we come into contact. We ask these things through the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, everybody have a good night and a good week and Sharon safe travels. Um, be safe, everybody, and may you be strong in your faith. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. God, God bless. Bye. Bye.